Hi everyone, my name is Mardi and I'm the president of the University of Sussex Scientific Society. Scientific Society is a new student group created to bring cutting edge research and world leading scientists to Sussex to explore the leading scientific issues of the day. With that in mind, we're delighted to be hosting Professor Sir Robert Leckler as our speaker today. Professor Leckler is a world leading immunologist and physician and is formerly the Dean of King's College London Medical School. He's one of the world's foremost experts in organ transplantation. He's made invaluable contributions to our understanding of the immunobiology around it and in other areas of immunology. In his role as president of the Academy of Medical Sciences, Mr. Robert oversaw the UK science community's preparation during Britain's exit from the European Union and joins us today to discuss the future of organ transplantation, its thoughts on Brexit and the NHS, as well as coronavirus and the future of organ transplantation, as I said. The event will be co-hosted by the SMS Research Society, the Surgical Society and the Biomedical Sciences uh, Society and will involve a uh, 25 minute talk from Sir Robert followed by a Q&A session. We've got a few questions prepared uh, for Robert but this section is really for your questions so if you have any please put them in the chat function of the YouTube uh, video and uh, we'll get to them. But that's all from me. Uh, Robert the floor is yours. Thank you so much and thank you uh, very much indeed for inviting me. I'm, I'm delighted to have a chance to share uh, some thoughts and reflections with you. Um, what I'm planning to do, uh, and I'm going to go at a little bit of a pace to get through in about 25 minutes, I'm going to start off by just sharing with you my reflections on what is a really a watershed moment, I think, in biomedicine and healthcare, and I'll explain why I'm saying that. Um, and then I'll tell you why I'm actually excited about the coming decade. It's a nice thing to be able to say that you're excited in the middle of this pandemic that drags on, is dragging everybody down. And I'm sure you've all got stories of, of grief of one sort or another to relate. But I think looking ahead, it's an exciting decade. And then I'll share with you my small contribution uh, to some of that excitement and then uh, hand myself back to you to interrogate me in any way you see fit. So uh, let me see if I can share my screen. Is that working? Great. Okay, so as I say, I think this is a decade of unprecedented opportunity, matched, I should also say, by unprecedented challenge. So I don't need to tell you that our health and care system is under extraordinary stress. That was true before the pandemic, is even more true now. Arguably, it's unsustainable in its present form, and demands are inexorably rising with the aging of the population, uh, the drug bill ever is going ever upwards, and I think we need to do something different. More of the same will not suffice. But the reasons that I'm excited looking ahead uh, are threefold. Uh, if I could advance the slides. Hmm. There we go. Um, so the first is that I genuinely believe that there's a, an opportunity to take a fresh approach to something that's been underemphasized and underfunded, I think, uh, in recent years, even perhaps recent decades, and that is uh, disease prevention and health promotion. So if you look at the fraction of the healthcare budget that's spent on public health uh, prevention and health promotion, it's lamentably low. And in fact, there's been disinvestment in public health. Uh, in recent years, and that's been exposed, I think, by the pandemic. So I think there's now there are opportunities to stratify risk and target interventions in much more intelligent ways than we have done to date. The second big opportunity, which is absolutely essential that we take this opportunity, is that I think there's an opportunity to re-engineer our healthcare system using emerging and existing technologies to create a sustainable model. And the third uh, excitement comes from the fact that curative therapies are emerging. So I'm not gonna say anything about these first two, I'm very happy to take questions on them. I'm going to focus for a minute on curative therapies. It's a slightly depressing truth that actually medicine cures remarkably little. So we can cure some bacterial diseases with antibiotics. You could say that some surgical procedures are curative, taking a gallbladder out if you've got gallstones occasional cancers like Hodgkin's lymphoma, but otherwise we arrest sometimes disease processes and we help people to live with their long-term conditions. But I think this is a moment to up our game and there are three areas where I think that really 
will take off in the next decade. The first is the ability to either deliver genes or edit genes in somatic cells. There are around 6,000 human diseases called by, caused by single gene defects. They're all rare in their own right, but if you put them all together, it's a significant disease burden. And gene therapy and gene editing are getting into the clinic. So there are now uh, treatments for retinal diseases by delivering genes to the back of the eye, spinal muscular atrophy also, uh, immunodeficiency, treating bone marrow stem cells in children, and then editing in thalassemias and sickle cell disease to treat hemoglobinopathies. These are very exciting developments. And I think it may even be the case that gene therapy can be applicable to non-single gene disorders. That's an untested hypothesis, but it may turn out to be true. The second uh, curative therapy area that again, I'm very excited about is regenerative medicine. So there've been lots of trials of injecting stem cells of various sorts, which have had very mixed results. But there are now some emerging um, therapies that actually are allowing tissues to regenerate. And I'll come back to one of those at the end of my talk. And then the third area of curative therapies is my own sort of territory of immune manipulation. And as we get more sophisticated in the ways that we can turn the immune system on and off, I think the number of cancers that will turn out to be at least treatable, if not curable, is going to increase. And I also think in autoimmunity and transplantation, where you want to turn the immune system off, uh, new possibilities are emerging. So for all those reasons, I, I, I want to transmit to you a sense of real excitement as we go into the next decade and emerge from the pandemic. I think this decade has a huge amount to offer and we have a huge amount to offer it if we pursue these three themes. Now, let me turn uh, to my own uh, territory and, and, and tell you a little bit about my own uh, small contribution to all of this. Transplantation. Um, it's a magical moment when, if you, if you ever have the chance to go into an operating theatre and see a, an organ transplant, this is a kidney transplant, a human kidney transplant from a dead donor. Uh, it's just been plumbed in by the surgeon joining up the artery in the vein to the recipient. This is the ureter with the cut end of the ureter sitting on the kidney before it's plumbed into the bladder. And when the vascular clamps are taken off and this very anemic, uh, rather useless looking organ uh, plumps up, pinks up, and if you're lucky, you can actually see urine coming out of the end of the cut ureter. It's a magical moment. And I would say that organ transplantation was one of the major successes of modern medicine in the second half of the last century because it has become the treatment of choice for end stage failure of multiple organ systems as listed here. We don't do brain transplants, you may feel you know one or two people who might benefit, but there are some cell transplant experiments going on uh, for degenerative diseases of the brain. But for these other organ systems, it is now a routine treatment and the short term success rates are phenomenally good. So well over 90%, 12 months survival of kidney transplants, getting there for heart, lung, liver and pancreas. And that contrasts with when I qualified in medicine and started out in this business, it was around 50% survival uh, of the organ at, at one year. And that was at the expense of horrible doses of steroids with enormous side effects. So it's a terrific story and a, a great success story in many ways, but like so many stories, it's not a perfect story. And long-term success is more limited. And so the average half-life of a kidney transplant from a dead donor is stuck at around 12 years. And for all the improvements in short-term survival, long-term survival still is eluding us. And the three problems that limit the clinical application of transplantation are these. Firstly, that the success we can achieve is because of very powerful immunosuppressive drugs that of course depress the immune system in an indiscriminate manner. And those have side effects, for example, an increased risk of cancer and opportunistic infection. Secondly, chronic rejection, which is why kidneys get inexorably lost over time. And thirdly, um, the shortage of organs. So we do not have, even if every theoretically usable kidney was used, we don't have enough to meet demand. All those three problems would be addressed if we could achieve uh, this elusive goal of immune tolerance to the transplant. It would address all three issues because you wouldn't need those powerful drugs uh, it would address the chronic rejection issue because the kidney transplant would last longer and thereby it would address the organ shortage problem because um, you wouldn't get patients going back on dialysis waiting for a second or third transplant. Now, the field of 
transplantation tolerance really kicked off in the middle of the last century. And, and one of the early pioneers, an unsung hero, was a guy called Ray Owen, working with a strain of cattle, an unusual strain of cattle, uh, where dizygotic shin twins shared a placental circulation. And he found that as a consequence, they would accept transplanted tissue from each other after birth. And he wondered whether that was something to do with the shared placental circulation. There was a famous British immunologist, Peter Medawar, who got the Nobel Prize for his work, who noticed this work of Ray Owen and tested a similar phenomenon in mice. And there was a seminal paper in Nature in 1954, where he showed that if he took newborn mice right after birth and injected them with a foreign population of white blood cells from another mouse strain, six weeks later, those mice would accept a skin transplant from the same strain as the white blood cells came. It was donor specific tolerance because they would reject a third party strain from a, a skin graft from another strain. And people thought, hey, Bisto, this is great. Um, this was just around the time that organ transplantation was starting in patients. Uh, and people thought, well, this is going to be an easy problem to crack. We won't need to use drugs. It's turned out to be a very long and winding road towards applying that in the clinic. Um, and I've been one of a number of people who've been working on this for quite some time. But what I want to share with you is that we are finally making progress. Now, just as a brief diversion, I wanted to show you this um, painting. Uh, to my knowledge, it's the first clinical case report of tissue transplantation in man. It's a very interesting painting by a Renaissance Italian artist called Fra Angelico. The original's hanging in an art gallery in Florence. It's interesting for many regards. <clears throat> it's depicting the patron saints of modern medicine, Saints Damien and Cosmos, supposedly transplanting a limb supposedly from an Ethiopian donor, hence the color of the skin, onto a young man in the early church. Now, when I teach students about transplantation, I often show this painting and I ask them to contrast what they're seeing here with a modern day operating theater, which if you haven't even been in one, I'm sure you've seen them in film or on television. And you might say, well, the operating table is a little bit basic. That's true. You may say, well, there's no intravenous infusion. There's no anesthetist. That's a bit alarming. All of those points are absolutely valid, but the most striking difference between then and now is here because I've had the pleasure of working with many surgeons in my career, but I've yet to meet a surgeon with a halo. But putting that aside, they're wonderful people, surgeons, but they don't have halos. But this painting really is about optimism. And I say that because you'll see that the operating theater has put two shoes beside the operating table. Imagine this young man's gonna walk away on two legs. Tissue transplantation, sorry, limb transplantation, didn't work then, it doesn't really work now. There've been occasional hand transplants, but they're very rare. But this is a painting about optimism, as I say, and I want to persuade you that you can be a little optimistic about transplantation tolerance. Now I'm going to take a big risk now and try and explain a little bit of the basics of the immune system to you. And I know it's a foreign language, but try and stay with me. So this is a very simplified diagram of how the specific immune response works. When a foreign a pathogen gets into the system, uh, the proteins of that pathogen get presented by what are called antigen presenting cells as little peptides are shown in yellow here. And the presenting mechanism is that the peptides are presented by self proteins called HLA proteins or a class one and class two types of HLA. And T cells, which are a population of white cells that trigger the immune response and get it going, recognize these peptides through their antigen receptor only when they see them in the context of these docking HLA molecules. When that T cell meets a peptide for which it's specific in the context of self HLA, it gets activated and then drives a series of effector immune mechanisms, the quantity and quality of which are determined by these so-called cytokines, they're hormone-like molecules that are released by the T cell. So central, really central to the immune response is, are these HLA molecules that present peptides for recognition by T cells. Here's a, 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 an electron micrograph of the, how these elegant these interactions are. This is an antigen presenting cell with a very convoluted membrane interacting with a lymphocyte. Now this is what an HLA molecule really looks like. It's a ribbon diagram. They're very elegant structures. And here in green is the peptide occupying this HLA molecule for recognition by T cells. But a key point is that all your HLA molecules, as you set there this evening, 
are occupied by peptides. And of course, 99.9% .9 of those peptides are not from foreign pathogens, unless you have the misfortune to be grappling with a virus at this moment. They're peptides of your own proteins that your cells are constantly breaking down. So these HLA molecules to be stable, they have to have a peptide sitting in this groove, but the vast majority of those peptides are peptides of your own proteins. You'll see why this is relevant in a moment. The problem with transplantation is that foreign HLA molecules, so HLA molecules from another individual, and what I haven't told you is that these HLA molecules are the most polymorphic of all your genes and their encoded proteins. There are several HLA loci, and each of them has about 400 different alleles in the human population. So matching for HLA, unless you're talking within a family, is extremely, extremely difficult. And foreign HLA molecules uh, induce very, very strong immune responses. And it's a phenomenon called alloimmunity. That is the real challenge of transplantation and transplantation tolerance. Now, let me give you one more insight into immunology. And that is the extraordinary the ability of the immune system to discriminate between invading pathogens and their proteins and your own proteins. Your life depends on this discrimination because otherwise your immune system would destroy you uh, in a very short space of time. And the reason that this discrimination happens is because you are tolerant, immunologically tolerant to your own proteins. And it's a quite extraordinary achievement. Here's an illustration of what the immune system manages to achieve. So here's an antigen presenting cell covered in these HLA molecules or about a million on an average antigen presenting cell. And they're occupied with all these yellow peptides, which are peptides of your own proteins. And here's a passing T cell paying no attention uh, because it is tolerant. And I'll explain why in a moment. If a pathogen gets into the system and one or two of these HLA molecules now are displaying these blue foreign peptides, then the T cell gets interested and its receptor binds to this complex. And as a consequence, if this has the right receptor, it gets activated and then starts off an immune response leading to the virus infected cells being killed. So that discrimination is a remarkable thing. And the way it works is twofold. The reasons you're tolerant to your own proteins is firstly that where T cells grow up in the thymus, you eliminate most of the ones that react against your own proteins. And that's a deletion mechanism. But you also have another mechanism, a fail-safe mechanism in the peripheral immune system with regulation mediated by a dedicated population of T cells called regulatory cells. And that's what I'm going to talk about now. So these regulatory cells, they are made in the thymus where T cells grow up and exported into the periphery. You can characterize them using antibodies and flow cytometry. Everybody has them. It's around 10% of your circulating T cells are these regulatory cells. And the evidence that they are crucial to self tolerance comes from experiments in mice. If you knock out the gene responsible for the function of these cells, those mice get multiple autoimmune diseases or phenomena. And there are some inbred families that have a spontaneous knockout of that gene. And those humans, those families get multiple autoimmune diseases. So, you depend on the activity of these regulatory cells to prevent autoimmunity. So knowing that, we posed a very simple question. Might it be possible to harness the function of these regulatory cells and hijack them and persuade them to make recipients tolerant to the foreign proteins on a transplanted organ? So we've done all that. We've done publish a lot of papers on this in mouse, experimental mouse models. Of course, we wanted to get to the clinic. And so as a surrogate uh, for a clinical experiment, we use what's called a humanized mouse. So that's taking a mouse that has no immune system due to genetic, it's genetically modified, so it has no immune system. It therefore will accept a piece of human skin provided by the plastic surgeons, which we transplant onto these mice, leave it to bed in for four to six weeks, and then at the same time, we isolate antigen presenting cells from this uh, skin donor and use them to stimulate regulatory cells from another human being. So that generates a series of regular, a population of regulatory cells specific for the transplant antigens. And then we infuse those regulatory cells along with effector cells 
uh, into these animals carrying these human skin grafts to see whether the regulatory cells could control the rejection response. So here's a very simple, you don't need to be a pathologist to interpret this, these slides. This is looking at a piece of human skin sitting on a mouse. If you put in human white blood cells, then they infiltrate the skin. And this brown staining is infiltration by human lymphocytes, human leukocytes of various sorts into the skin graft. That triggers a rejection response, one of the features of which is that the keratinocytes start dividing furiously, and this brown staining is keratinocyte division, and the involucrin protective layer is destroyed. If you put in regulatory cells as well as effector cells, the infiltrate is heavier because you've got a mixture of effectors and regulators in the tissue, but the keratinocyte proliferation is pretty well abolished and the involucrin layer is protected. So this is an example of the sort of data we got carefully quantitated with immunofluorescence. And here it is looking uh, uh, at a whole animal. This is a human piece of human skin sitting on the back of a mouse quite happily uh, and healthily. If you put in uh, the human white cells, the effector cells, then that graft is rejected and this is basically just turned into a scar. If you put in the regulatory cells, you can see you preserved a very happy piece of human skin. So these kinds of data persuaded us that it was safe and appropriate to go into the clinic and indeed the regulator was also persuaded. So the clinical vision would be that you take a patient with end stage organ failure who's going to have a transplant, you take blood uh, from that patient, you purify and expand those regulatory cells ex vivo and then infuse them back into the patient following the transplant. Now this of course requires a very sophisticated um, manufacturing process that is entirely safe, it's pathogen free and so on. You need to expand the cells substantially. I won't give you all the details of that. They're then frozen while you do, uh, you put them through their paces in terms of release criteria, phenotype, suppressive function, safety, sterility, et cetera, et cetera, uh, and then infuse them back into patients. And um, uh, the chairman of this session mentioned Brexit in the context of his introduction. I'm pleased to tell you about a very nice study that we conducted across Europe. This was an EU funded study uh, while we were still part of the EU. Uh, we had some latecomers from Boston and San Francisco, um, and it was a terrific example of collaborative research across multiple centers. Uh, the protocol was basically, this was a safety study I should add, the protocol involved standard immunosuppression uh, for the reference group, slightly reduced immunosuppression and Treg therapy for the um, cell therapy group. And we were able to uh, do a dose escalation study in 12 patients from 1 million per kilogram to 10 million per kilogram. Uh, the patients who had the cells, this is their serum keratinines, they did brilliantly well. All those keratinines came briskly down and stayed completely flat. Um, there were no episodes of rejection in this group, no acute toxicity, no serious side effects. In the reference group, there were 15% of patients had a rejection episode. Now, I'm the first to admit that this is statistically insignificant because the numbers are so small, but it was encouraging with a hint of efficacy uh, and was the basis of moving on now to proper efficacy studies. The final dimension uh, that I'll mention of this strategy is to engineer the regulatory cells so that they all are specific for the donor antigens rather than being polyclonal. And we've been doing that now by gene modifying the cells, putting a receptor, a gene into these regular cells that encodes a receptor that targets the transplant proteins. These are called CAR T cells. You may have heard that about that in the context of cancer. This is doing exactly the same thing, but in the context of regulatory cells. So we're engineering these CAR expressing T regs, uh, tested those in vitro, in vivo, in a humanized mouse model, and they're clearly superior. And that has led to the formation of a spin-out company called Quell Therapeutics that's come out of this work. It's benefited, I'm happy to say, from 15 million pounds investment from a venture fund called Syncona. And we're well on the way to a clinical trial in liver transplant recipients uh, in the latter part of this year. So let me finish by um, returning back to one of those curative therapies that if successful might make transplantation itself redundant, it might do me out of a job as it were. Um, now, many common degenerative conditions are due to the 
irrecoverable loss of cells from tissues that can't repair themselves. It applies to the heart, it applies to the brain, it applies to the pancreas, it applies to the retina, it applies to the cochlea. Here is a cardiac myocyte, and here's your fact for the day. You may have known this. These are very elegant cells with their uh, sophisticated myofibrils that allow them to contract. The, the cardiac myocytes that you're depending on now as you're, you're sitting there with your heart beating away are the same ones with which you were born. You haven't, they haven't divided at all. You may say, well, how did my heart get bigger from when I was a baby? And the answer is the cells themselves got bigger. They did not multiply. So when you have a heart attack, if you have a heart attack, uh, you kill off a lot of cardiac myocytes. And because the heart can't replace those, you repair that myocardial infarct with a scar. And of course, scars don't pump well, and that's why you get heart failure. So cardiac myocyte deficiency un underlies uh, many uh, causes of heart failure. And uh, we've recently recruited to King's uh, a fantastic uh, scientist called Mauro Jacca from Italy, um, who's doing some work that I think is some of the most work, some some of the most exciting work I'm aware of in the field of regenerative medicine. Because the holy grail of cardiac regeneration has been to persuade the heart tissue to repair itself. Uh, as I mentioned to you, when you have a heart attack, you lose several billion cardiac myocytes, and you can't do anything other than repair them with a scar. So uh, the holy grail would be to persuade the surrounding tissue to proliferate with healthy myocytes and repair that defect instead of form a scar. What Mauro Jacka has been exploring is the possibility of manipulating the transcriptional profile of these cardiac myocytes in a way that will turn on their proliferative capacity. And he's been doing that with small inhibitory RNAs, probably you're familiar with those, and he said, you've been using a library of a thousand of these micro RNAs and screening using a robotic high throughput screening system and identified a very small number that appear to have this capability. So he first tested that in a mouse model and injected mice with those small inhibitory RNAs. And you can see looking at the one on the right compared to the one on the left, how much proliferation was caused by these inhibitory RNAs. And they wanted to get into a preclinical model. So he's been working with uh, three to six month old farm pigs, inducing, deliberately inducing a heart attack by blocking, blocking off the LAD coronary artery and then um, after uh, reperfusing it uh, after 90 minutes and then injecting surrounding the infarcted tissue, these small inhibitory RNAs. And this uh, next series of images is going to show you the effect uh, of doing exactly that. So these are MR scans with contrast you're looking here at the left ventricle of the pig. Uh, and if this video works, yeah. So each time the uh, heart beats, you should eject the majority of the blood in the left ventricle, but you can see that this infarcted animal is pumping very poorly and excluding, I would estimate, probably something like 25% <clears throat> of the blood in the left ventricle. Here are two uh, hearts that have been treated with their small inhibitory RNAs. And you can see how much better this heart is pumping. I would say the injection fraction here is well over 50%. Uh, and this second animal here, the same thing. So this is really exciting work uh, in a preclinical setting. And of course, the challenge now is to get this into man. And there are many challenges yet to be overcome to make that happen. But I think it's a real possibility. So the vision would be uh, when your elderly gentleman has just come out of a rather fatty meal in a restaurant on a cold winter's night without carrying a heavy bag, he's already overweight, gets chest pain, ambulance whisks him off to hospital. And instead of just doing a usual uh, percutaneous intervention, that is accompanied by injecting these small inhibitory RNAs, allowing the heart to repair itself and function properly. So back to my optimism slide, I think for various reasons that I've shared with you tonight, uh, there are real grounds for optimism in terms of the future of our ability to cure more diseases, not only transplantation tolerance, but maybe regenerative medicine. Thanks very much.
Thank you very much, Robert. That was really interesting. And I think we've got a few questions coming in already um, from the audience. And so if you do have questions, please put them in there. But I thought I'd start with uh, one or two just from uh, me and my co-host uh, for the night, who I very regrettably did not introduce at the start. So I'll let her introduce herself in just a second. But I suppose my first question um, is about Maxim Kira's law. Uh, and I, arguably the most promising development in organ transplantation in the UK um, was the introduction, um, introduction of that law last year, um, changing the UK's organ donation system from opt-in to opt-out. And so I, I wanted to get a few of your thoughts on this. Okay, well, it's a very interesting topic. Um, I have to say that, and I, I hope I'm not going to upset anybody, I don't think that opting in and opting out laws are really the major issue here. Because if you take the countries that have done, have moved to opt out, um, in reality, it still is the case that when a loved one is on the intensive care unit and has been deemed to be brain dead and therefore capable of donating organs, the transplant coordinators will still talk to the family. And if the nearest and dearest say, no, absolutely, I refuse to let you um, harvest my son's, my husband's, whatever, kidney, then that kidney won't be harvested. So almost overriding everything is the family wishes. Now you may say that's wrong, but that is how it is. And so really what I think is the most important is the public sympathy with uh, organ donation. And I think you need a real drive to, to help people to understand that this is actually turning a death into saving other people's lives and all that stuff. I'm sure I don't need to persuade you. Uh, if you take the country that's the poster child of organ transplantation or donation rates, which is Spain, the reason Spain has done so well, it's probably double what the UK does in terms of uh, organs per dead person, um, is because they've got a fantastic network of transplant coordinators who are really, really good at approaching the family. They've got a really good intensive care capacity so that they can support people when they're brain dead before organ donation decisions are made. Those, I would argue, are the most important things. Public sympathy, uh, transplant coordinators and intensive care capacity. So I don't, of course, I would support moving to an opt out rather than opt in, but I don't think it is the big issue. Right, thank you. Uh, I guess one route to immortality is, uh, in a way, is organ transplantation. Absolutely. Uh, so, Catherine, uh, I will let you introduce yourself, um, and I think you've got a question, a uh, very interesting one, actually, that I'm excited to hear. Okay, so I'm Catherine. Um, I'm the co-host. Um, yeah, during your talk, you mentioned, um, you mentioned using, uh, like, you mentioned like brain transplants, right? Um, and I think we, it's something like out of science fiction. So usually the stuff you hear about are, you know, scientists in China or in Italy, you know, transplanting full heads, you know, and it never works. But I think um, like, I'm kind of interested in hearing more about like the, um, the potential of these therapies that you mentioned, like if, we could, you know, cure or provide better therapies for people with neurodegenerative disorders. Mm. Yeah, well, I guess the way to come at this, if, if, if you're wanting a kind of ethical debate about brain transplantation, would be to have that usual conversation. If I cut off your toes, are you still you? If I cut off your feet, I mean, at what point do you stop being you? And I think most people would say, I stop being me when you take my head off um, because you, m most people I think would say, and it's your personality and your character that really defines you. Um, you can fiddle and do all sorts of cosmetic things with bits of your body and change your appearance even. I mean, a face transplant is an interesting one because I think people who have face transplants, they've got all sorts of psychological issues but not recognizing themselves in the mirror. But I think, uh, I, I would think that brain transplants is complete I mean, if you do a brain transplant, then you're, you're putting a brain onto someone else's body is the way I would see it. Um, the, however, cellular transplantation uh, has been tried in Parkinson's in particular. I think the difficulty is being able to regulate the behavior of the cells that are introduced into the brain. Um, and these have been not in anywhere near sufficient numbers to 
alter the um, cognitive function of the brain. Uh, these have been replacing the dopamine producing cells and so on. So I think, I, I think that that has yet got potential as does the sort of approach I've just described. If you can, um, in, in, in Alzheimer's, early, if you can detect really early stages of Alzheimer's and you can turn off the disease process and cause repair to happen with endogenous cells, that would seem to me the way to go. Okay, thank you. I suppose if I could just follow up on that. Uh, so talking about endogenous cells, you mentioned um, Professor Jacker's work earlier. I, I wanted to talk about an audience question here um, from uh, Elisa, and she said that she's heard about 3D printed drugs and how right now they're mainly being used to test drugs, um, three, sorry, 3D printed organs, and that they're uh, currently being used to test drugs, but how long until they can be used in transplantations or will they ever be used in transplantations? But I guess if I could just jump on that as well, um, I know of, uh, many organs have been made, organoids, I think they're called. I suppose, how promising do you think that is? Yeah, yeah, no, good, great, great questions. Um, I think that, uh, I do think these fields have got uh, potential. I mean, clearly, you, you, I'm sure I'm stating the obvious here, but if you take the kidney, which is I mean, the organ I've worked on for most of my life, it's, it's quite a complicated um, organ. And so to 3D print a kidney, you, 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 you've got to um, provide sufficient sort of scaffolding to persuade cells to uh, form structures that are going to give you collecting ducts and nephrons and vasculature and everything else. So it, it's, um, I think it's some way off being possible, but there are simpler tissues. And, and so the easiest tissues, of course, are the ones where most has been done, like cartilage, um, which is a relatively, <clears throat> excuse me, relatively simple tissue, maybe pancreatic islets. Um, so I think, I think all of these have got potential. I guess what I'm what I'm sharing with my is my own bias, and that is that um, rather than having to engineer organs ex vivo or transplant organs, if one can cause endogenous tissue repair in the sort of way that uh, Mario Jacka is doing, I think that could be applicable to many many kinds of tissues and would be, to my mind, the, the best of all worlds because you're not introducing anything uh, foreign to the recipient. Um, and you're using an endogenous repair mechanism. The, the challenge, of course, is, is if you do start cells proliferating, you've got to be able to turn them off. Otherwise, you're going to get um, uh, a very distorted piece of tissue. That's obviously true. Um. I'm just going to ask an audience question. Um, Elena Che says, um, regarding treatment of scar formations after a heart attack, when the inhibitory um, microRNA contribute, um, yeah, um, to over proliferation resulting in possible tumors? If so, how is this controlled? Yeah, well, you're absolutely right, and and um, that's a very smart question. And as I just said, that that is true. So. The, those uh, pig experiments I described uh, with the fantastic um, scans that I showed you, those pigs did die and they died of arrhythmias because of uncontrolled proliferation. So um, obviously what you need to do is be able to turn the proliferation on and be able to turn it off. And again, I mean, that's not beyond the realm of possibility. Um, and uh, what Marrow is now exploring is, because at the moment he's, he's introducing these microRNAs um, using viral vectors. If you can do this in a non-viral way uh, and you can co-introduce a suicide gene so that once the cells are divided a certain amount, you can turn them off. That obviously is essential because as you quite rightly say, otherwise you're at risk of getting tumors or a rather disordered tissue. Right. I think maybe we could, it's a zebrafish, right? Zebrafish are the uh, animals that have got uh, regenerative capacity. So maybe one day we'll be a little bit more like zebrafish. But I would like to uh, change uh, track, if that's all right, and move to something a little bit away from science and more into the realm of your role as president of the Academy of Medical Sciences. Perhaps the defining domestic and foreign policy issue of our generation, um, that being Brexit, and uh, it's been a while, I think we could all agree, uh, since the referendum happened and since 
uh, the negotiations took place and the deals were made, but we're now after the fact. We've left the European Union. And so I want to take you back to 2016, specifically to the week after the referendum. And I believe it was the induction ceremony for the, the fellows and um, for the uh, Royal um, Academy of Medicine, uh, sorry, for the Academy of Medical Sciences that year. But you briefly touched on the result and you stated that Brexit posed a threat to research in the UK um, as EU funding, um, EU data and free movement of talent was extremely important to UK research. And so I was wondering sort of five years after the referendum, if you've seen those fears play out, have there been any unforeseen new challenges? And uh, what do you think now? Yeah, well, this is a painful topic um, because I have to declare myself as a, a very, very potent Remainer. And of course, I'm speaking to you from Italy. My wife is Italian. And uh, what Giovanna would say to you is that since that referendum result, she feels less at home in the UK than she did before. She would say it's an emotional thing. It's not a necessarily a rational thing, but it's just how she feels. Uh, and I understand that. So I don't know how many Brexit speeches I've <laughs> given over the years. Um, my presidency at the Academy uh, had two dark clouds hanging over it. The first was Brexit and then that got slightly displaced by COVID. So the, it hasn't been the most cheerful uh, period of history. Um, my Brexit speeches were always organized under four Ps, people, partnerships, pounds and permissions. Um, pounds actually meaning euros and permissions really being regulation but it doesn't start with a P. So I think all of those uh, four Ps are risks. Um, I think, of course, the Academy of Medical Sciences and, and I were not the only people emphasizing the people point. I think that was very strongly emphasized by a number of agencies. And the good news is the government has listened to that. And so uh, they brought in last year the Global Talent Visa, which is a terrific uh, innovation, making it really easy for people to come to the UK. The, the one remaining wrinkle is that the cost of a visa is, is still far too high. It's out of kilter with other countries. And that's something that we're pressurizing the government to address. Um, but I think the government genuinely uh, really wants to make the UK a, a magnet for talent. Um, I don't think, I'm pleased to say, I don't think there has been much of a negative impact on recruiting talent from overseas. The impact on student numbers uh, from Europe, I mean, you'd be quite close to that yourselves probably, uh, clearly one would predict that there's going to be a drop if they have to pay um, overseas fees. Um, and that would be a shame. And the loss of the Erasmus programme, I think, is, is um, very regrettable. My, my youngest son, I think, got one of the last Erasmus um, scholarships that was on, on offer. Um, so I think the people thing, it, we just need to be really vigilant um, and, and do everything we can to make the UK as attractive as possible. So that still, I think, is is a living risk. The partnerships thing, the thing that the EU did uniquely well was uh, coordinate multilateral, multinational partnerships. We can all do bilateral partnerships. And since the Brexit result, there've been a springing up of, you know, many universities, I'm not sure about Sussex, have developed partnerships with this or that or the other university or city around the world. But these multinational partnerships are very difficult to construct and to support and to fund and the EU did it uniquely well. Um, so, of course, we've been arguing to associate with Horizon Europe. It looks as though we probably will. But nonetheless, our influence in Horizon Europe will be markedly diminished uh, from where it was. And we will not do as well from it as we did. So, again, managing partnerships will need a great deal of care and attention. The really positive news here is that our European partners really want us. Um, and. I guess that's not surprising because, you know, British science and biomedical science in particular is, is very strong. Um, the money bit, the pounds bit, um, that's the, the horizon Europe uh, unknown. Um, we've been net winners out of um, uh, the European funding and until now we won't be net winners going forward. So there will be a loss. Um, but, you know, this is a government that is genuinely committed to science and remains committed to getting 2.4% of GDP in R&D. And that's remarkable given the financial pickle that we're in. So I think we should celebrate the fact we've got a pro-science government, even after Dominic Cummings has departed because he was a major protagonist for that. Um, and then the regulation bit is interesting. Uh, and here, maybe if you're looking for a Brexit dividend, maybe 
the UK can make itself a really agile regulator for some of these novel therapies that I've been talking about this evening, which need imaginative regulation. Um, and we are good at regulation. We're internationally regarded highly for regulation. Uh, and the EMA moving away from the UK was a big loss for us, but a big loss for the EMA as well. So I think um, maybe we've, we can yet uh, make something out of our uh, being more agile, a sort of agility dividend of Brexit. Sorry, maybe that was too long an answer, but I have a lot to say on the topic. <laughs> no, it's great. Um, I have a follow-up question for that. Um, I was just wondering what it was like to have, um, and it, like, what was the experience like having a seat at the table with like the Brexit negotiations and stuff? And did you find there was a unified approach throughout the scientific community, like during the uh, negotiations? Remarkable, remar the answer to the second part of your question, remarkable, uh, remarkable concordance of view. But that was really, really fantastic. Um, mm -hmm. Not absolute, but I mean, you know, we agreed on almost everything, all the major uh, players. And that was very, very helpful, of course. On your first point, I mean, it was bizarre. So I remember, do you remember at the beginning, David Davis was the man uh, with, in, put, with given responsibility for Brexit. Uh, and the first time we met with David Davis, he came along with a bunch of his team. And what emerged was that all his team were Remainers but, you know, they were civil servants and civil servants do what the government says they're going to do. And so they were just putting into practice what the country had voted to do. So uh, it's been a very funny process. Um, and uh, more recently, um, yeah, some very interesting interactions. Dominic Cummings, I mean, that's a topic of another seminar, really. But Dominic Cummings is a very interesting person. And he, of course, orchestrated the Vote Leave campaign. The Prime Minister himself, I mean, my own take on, on Boris is that he's not really particularly a Brexiteer. I mean, I think that was a political choice that he made. So I think that actually uh, the Prime Minister is quite pro-European in many ways, as well as being a sort of libertarian. So um, I think it, it has been interesting. There's been a change of the guard as times has gone on. And, and the Minister with the responsibility of the science has been a revolving door. So. Do you remember it was then Joe Johnson, Boris's brother? In fact, I, my first meeting with Joe Johnson, uh, he ended the meeting saying, I've got to go and campaign for Remain. So Joe was a Remainer, Boris was a Lever. And then when Joe left government, it was to spend less time with his family, if you remember. So there was Joe Johnson, then there was Sam Gmar, um, and then Sam Gmar joined the breakaway party. Then we had Joe Johnson back, then we had um, Chris Skidmore. So it just kept changing. And that, of course, made life difficult. You had to keep on making the same arguments again and again. You felt like a, a groundhog day and a broken record. But no, it was it was interesting. And as I say, I do think that the government did listen to some of the points made and some of the risks are now mitigated. But I think it's a national folly. Yeah, you spoke about, uh, <laughs> this is a remarkable political insights, I have to say, but I'm um, talking about partnerships just for a second. There's been a lot of, I guess, in, from some corners, criticism about public-private partnerships, especially with regard to the NHS. I don't think I need to uh, explain to anyone who's watching just how much vitriol has been thrown on the idea of privatization of the NHS um, for the last four or five years. And recently it came out that uh, this government was thinking about reversing some of that and uh, not offering contracts out to, uh, to private um, tenders. So I guess I wanted to ask um, from your perspective as somebody that um, has worked uh, with elements of both public and private um, elements of those partnerships, how important is that private enterprise really to our, um, to our research? I guess from my perspective, you look at the rate at which the vaccines were produced, one might say quite important, but I, I suppose I wonder how would you reconcile that perhaps with the, the moral question of should they be that important? Gosh, that's a really big topic. Um, and we're getting probably going to run out of time. But um, so I'll, I'll focus my answer, if I may, on where you took the question, which was toward life sciences industries, as opposed to private healthcare providers. I can, I'm happy to come back to private healthcare providers if you wish. But in terms of life sciences industries, um, I am deeply committed to 
strengthening partnerships between universities, NHS and life sciences industries. I think it's absolutely key to our success. So uh, one of the roles that I have now is, is helping to develop what's called a life sciences cluster. It's bringing those three sectors together in South London. It's going really well. The reason I think it's so important is that all three of those sectors have complementary skills and broadly speaking, uh, have overlapping aims. Now you say you could say that the life sciences industry is interested in making money. Of course, that is partly true, but they are, are interested in making money out of making really good drugs. Um, and they do have complementary skills. So, so they're, some of these industries are very good at uh, high throughput screening. They're very good at toxicology. Um, they're very good at GMP manufacture and so on. Academics bring different skills to the party. And of course, the healthcare system defines what the needs are. So we're working very hard at King's and the King's partners to really embed industry in the heart of our operation. Um, so we've got now uh, a mid-sized pharma company embedding their research really along with our research. Same thing with the GSK partnership, same thing with med tech industries. And I think that is um, the way forward. Um, and I think it generates health and wealth. And of course, generating health in a local economy is good for your health. Uh, did I say that right? Generating wealth in the local economy is good for your health. Um, and so the, our local authorities in South London are deeply committed to this because they see job creation uh, and health generation going together. So that's my, my, my take on the life sciences bit. Thank you. I think just in the interest of time, we'll uh, probably zoom through the next couple of questions. We've got a few audience ones. Uh, we'll touch on COVID and then we've got a few quick fire questions for you as well. But I'll pass over to Catherine for those. So um, we have an audience question about if there's a potential for GI tract transplants um, for like diseases like uh, IBD. And does the gut microbiota complicate the potential of such transplants? Mm. Interesting question. Um, so um, intestinal transplants do happen. Um, they are difficult um, for a variety of reasons. It's partly because your gut itself has quite a um, sophisticated immune system in it. Um, and of course that immune system is there to uh, avoid um, um, to avoid too much of a, an immune reaction against the microbiome, as, as the question just points out. So it's a complicated and sophisticated immune system and uh, intestinal transplants, while they're done, that they're done in small numbers and need a lot of immunosuppression. And um, I couldn't quote you success rates, but they're not that high. <clears throat> so I think touching back on, on the theme that I talked about of regular regulatory cells, for example, um, I think there's real potential in using regulatory cell therapy, again, probably genetically modified to treat diseases like IBD. I think that's got um, real legs. The microbiome, well, there's another whole topic and, and um, uh, it's a very fashionable topic and you always need to be a little bit nervous about when things become fashionable because Quite often then some of the publications that come out are not of the quality that um, will stand the test of time. Nonetheless, the microbiome is clearly important, clearly influential. Um, and um, of course, then you get into a completely another territory of transplantation, which is fecal transplantation. Um, and uh, that again seems to be effective for some forms of intestinal inflammation. So it's a really complicated topic and uh, one, I think we, we're we on the sort of um, beginner's slopes of understanding. Okay, sure. Yeah, I'd heard about the fecal transplants one, but I hadn't heard about fully transplanting like the intestines. Yeah. Um, okay, I have another audience question um, from Alex. Do you think that uh, more doctors should go into academic medicine um, copying like the US model? And what are the benefits over just being a scientist? Mm -hmm. Uh, uh, right, so I think that um, in terms of managing your career, whether you're a clinical, whether you're, you're a medic or whether you're a basic scientist, whatever, 
the key is to identify uh, what really interests you and what you're really good at. Uh, and if you're turned on by the science of medicine, then I would strongly recommend a clinical academic career. I don't think there's a, I can't think of a better career. Um, I, I, I feel extremely lucky to have had the career I've had. Um, but <clears throat> it's a matter of identifying A, what really interests you and B, what you're really good at. And, and so my strong advice in career management is get as much feedback as you can from as many people as you can, as you try to work out where your strengths lie and where you're then going to apply your energies. Because a recipe for happiness is to match your ambitions and your abilities. A recipe for stress and unhappiness is to mismatch those. Right, thank you. Uh, so we'll just ask, I think, one or two more questions and then go through the quick fire. I guess the one that I was quite interested to hear about is, um, it's a question about public trust. And I know it's something that you've touched on in previous talks that you've given, uh, but I want to just look at it in the context of COVID-19 and the situation we find ourselves in at the moment. The anti-vax movement has been unfortunately growing uh, in its size and in its uh, in its strength, I suppose, over the last um, 10 to 15 years. And, you know, in COVID-19, you see the rise of COVID deniers as well as uh, even more anti-vaxxers. And I think much of it can be put down to um, social media and just how much information is available online. While that's great for letting people take agency over elements of their care, it also has this negative side to it as well. I wonder, has the scientific community done enough to prevent this, do you think? And if they have, is there anything more they could do to help fight? Mm. Very important question again. Uh, the answer, the short answer is no, we have not done enough. I'm absolutely sure we haven't done enough. So the public engagement and, and, and public communication of science, I used to think uh, was kind of a bit of a chore and a bit of an add-on. And so when you write a grant application, any of you that have I don't think to do with the grant application. There's a little bit at the end saying, how are you going to communicate your results to the public? And people tokenistically fill it in just as a bit of a, uh, bit of a joke, really. It's not a joke, it's, it's essential. And uh, it's part of our duty, I think, to tell the story uh, in a way that the public can really understand it, because it's a great story to tell. And um, people need to understand the fantastic advances. I, I gave a talk, uh, uh, gosh, I've lost track of time, probably about a year ago, uh, 10 advances that changed the world. I just picked my top 10 uh, breakthroughs in medical science. And it was a fantastically energizing talk to give. And you just forget, um, many of these things are really quite recent. I mean, antibiotics, and they came in in the Second World War. Before that, if you got sepsis, I mean, you were, you were gone. Um, so I think we just need to be much more diligent and active at explaining what medical science is doing, what it's achieved. I mean, the vaccine story, you, you referred to it. What a phenomenal, phenomenal achievement within a year. And, and it looks as though we might have the whole adult population in this country vaccinated by July. I mean, that, that is really remarkable. And it does reflect our scientific strength. It requires, it, it reflects what you referred to, which is academic industry, NHS partnerships. Uh, reflects our expertise at clinical trials, all that stuff. So now I think we've been too lazy uh, and allowed uh, other people to make too much noise. All right, thank you, Robert. Uh, so we'll just zoom through those quick fire questions now and then uh, we'll let you enjoy the rest of your evening. Um, and so I'll ask the um, first two and then I'll ask, I'll let Catherine uh, take the last three. So we talked about this briefly before the event started. Uh, you're a family man. Um, you've spoken about the importance that your family is. And uh, I read that you have five kids. How did you find balancing your career and your family? Uh, well, I'm sure I didn't get it right. Um, I, um, I, I, I did my very best to make time. But I think you, you probably have to talk to my kids actually get an honest answer to that question. So I think I'm lucky to be able to say that I've got a good relationship with all my kids. But uh, it's also fair to say, if I'm quite honest, that I've had, I mean, these are two families, so, so I've been married twice, that um, the people that I've shared my life with have taken, I, they have taken more than their fair share. So I've not been a really a new man doing 50% of everything. I, um, and I, I couldn't have done what I have done if I had, if I did that and had five kids is the honest answer. But I, I'm very committed to my fatherly role and I, I love my kids and, and I make time for them. 
Right. Fantastic. Um, so the second question is, so growing up, did you have any scientific heroes or idols that inspired you? Mm. Um, well, I, I've, I've referred to one of them, um, and that was uh, Peter Medawar, um, who, and, and Peter Medawar, you, if you look back, he wrote some very interesting books um, about being a scientist. I think he was a very good example of someone who identified what he thought was a really important problem and something he found really interesting and pursued it um, and came up with some, some extraordinary breakthroughs. So I, I think it's, it's people who have a track record of focusing their energies on important questions. Uh, it's very easy to get distracted by relatively unimportant questions just because you can. Um, so I think the, the scientific heroes I'd pick out have been the ones that um, have doggedly pursued important issues even when life's been difficult. Yeah. Peter Medawar, what a fantastically witty writer. Yeah. But Catherine, I'll pass over to you now. Okay, so what would be your one piece of advice for junior doctors or medical students? Oh, I think I kind of said it. So look, you're, you're embarking on a fantastic career at a, at, and I think medicine is going to go through uh, a revolution and you're very lucky to be part of that. So I think my advice to you is, um, work out where what you find most interesting and what your particular skills are as you choose the path you're going to take through medicine because there are so many paths you can take and it's all too easy to be come under the influence of some charismatic mentor who says Catherine or Robert you know you should do this because that's what I did and what I do is the most important uh, that's not terribly helpful um, so avoid that sort of seduction and find out what really interests you, uh, find out what your skills are, and then go for it. Okay, thank you. Um, so what is one book that you'd recommend that we all read? Ah, oh, gosh. Uh, <laughs> oh dear. Well, uh, look, I don't know. I haven't got a ready-made answer for that. I'm, the, what I'm reading right now is light, but makes me laugh a lot. It's the Thursday Mur Murder Club. I don't know if you come across it. Oh yeah, it. it's a good book. <laughs> <laughs> it just tickles me enormously. Uh, Where the Crawdads Sing was the book I read before that, which I thought was really beguiling uh, story. So uh, I guess I, I tend to read books that take me out of the world that I'm in. Um, and that's in a sense their value rather than sort of heavy political tones or something, because I do enough politics without. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's fair enough. Um, okay, what is your go-to lockdown activity? Like painting? Mm. Yeah. Well, my go-to lockdown activity is um, is spending time in Umbria, uh, which I'm lucky enough to be able to do right now, uh, because we restored a ruin um, in a beautiful location looking down on the Spoleto Valley. So that's incredibly therapeutic. It's just very, it's full of aesthetic, sensual pleasure. Um, the food's good, the wine's good, the view's good. Um, and uh, when I'm here, I do try to make some time for sketching, which is a pastime, that, which is therapeutic because you have to concentrate on one thing for a sustained period and just shut out everything else. Mm -hmm. So um, those are some of my lockdown go-tos, but I'm lucky. Yeah. All right, I think, uh... That's all we have time for. I think we've gone a little over. So thank you for uh, staying with us for a few extra minutes. But I think I'll let Catherine um, say goodnight uh, on behalf of us both. Okay. Well, I mean, I'd like to thank you very much, Robert, um, for both your talk and answering all of our questions, especially quick fire questions. Um, we really appreciate you um, giving us your time. And a very big thank you to the audience for joining us. We really hope you enjoyed this event. Um, thank you to our partners for, for today's event. Uh, the BSMS Research Society and Surgical Sci Societies, as well as the Biomedical Science Society. Um, next week, we're going to be speaking to Alan Milburn, who's the former Secretary of State for Health in the last Labour government on the NHS and social mobility um, in a time of COVID-19. Um, you can find out more information about this um, on our Facebook page and our Instagram page. So give that a look and subscribe to our YouTube channel. But for now, thank you very much, Robert, and um, it's goodbye for me.